much has moved on over the course of those 10 to 11 years. So um, a, a real and burning issue um, uh, and one which is at the heart of our trust strategy and our commitments to improving population health and tackling health inequalities, which um, is experienced by um, a significant proportion of our, the populations that we serve as an organisation prior to the pandemic, which has been um, shown into um, an even harsher light as a consequence of the pandemic. Um, so really delighted, as I say, to welcome uh, Dr. Jess Allen, who is the Deputy Director at the Institute of Health Equity, uh, which is the uh, unit which um, has overseen um, uh, this work. Um, just before I hand over to Jess, uh, we've got quite a few people on the call, so just the usual discipline, please. Um, if you can remain on mute for the duration of the talk, but we do really want to have a bit of a debate. I think Jess will be talking to us for around about half an hour, and, but then after that, have the opportunity for questions, comments, discussion, um, what this means for us as an organisation in terms of next steps. So please do use the chat actively. Um, and um, just to note, we'll be recording the session. So if you're uncomfortable with that and don't want your face to be seen, please um, uh, um, turn off, uh, press the stop video. Right, without further ado, Jess, I'm hoping your microphone is, um, is, is still standing firm. Um, and over to you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for the introduction and for the opportunity to present some of our work. Um, you did a great job introducing um, because I'm just going to start at, in 2010 with what we set out. So I'm going to run very quickly through three reports which Richard mentioned um, because really there's a building narrative there which I think um, is partly explaining what has happened during the pandemic and what is going to happen um, as we hopefully emerge from it. So I'm going to share my screen and hopefully um, find the presentation. Great. Um, so next slide, please. Yes, just to say I'm the Deputy Director at the Institute for Health Equity um, and I've been working uh, alongside Michael since 2008 um, and have been uh, working on these reviews and perhaps even more importantly than the analysis that we've done in the reviews is how we've worked to embed the recommendations and practices um, that we've undertaken and I'm going to finish this presentation by just putting up a few thoughts about what the healthcare system um, might be able to do to help this really national agenda for reducing health inequalities. So the original Marmot Review in 2010 was commissioned by the government um, and the remit was to describe health inequalities in England, um, to describe the drivers of those health inequalities and critically propose action to monitor and reduce them. We have been there and we reported in 2010, of course. Uh, the next slide, please. Um, this was a really important graph, still is, for us, and um, just to say this still holds true, what I'm about to explain, um, and we're, we're still providing versions of this graph. Um, along the bottom axis, um, these are neighbourhoods. Every dot on this graph is a neighbourhood, and on the left-hand side, you've got the most deprived neighbourhoods, right-hand side, the least deprived, the wealthiest neighbourhoods. Um, and on the other axis, that's years. So this is life expectancy, the grey dots, and the green dots is healthy life expectancy. So how long someone could expect to live in good health. And you can see straight away, there's a very clear association between the level of neighbourhood deprivation and healthy life expectancy and life expectancy. So for those people living in the most deprived neighbourhoods, can unfortunately expect to get um, ill with a life limiting condition much earlier in their mid 50s than those living in the wealthiest areas where that happens around um, 70, even higher in some cases. Um, and if you're living in most deprived neighbourhoods, it's likely that your life expectancy um, is around 75, 74, 75, depending on gender. Um, and if you're in the wealthiest neighbourhoods, um, that goes up to beyond 80. Um, and in fact, in some areas, for example, in Westminster and London, 
uh, life expectancy is really, really high. Um, some of the highest local um, life expectancy in the world are some of those figures. So some really clear inequalities. So we're looking at very clear inequalities in health and in life expectancy. And we're also looking at a very clear systematic relationship between deprivation and health and life expectancy. This isn't just the health of the very poorest, which is affected, it's the health of everyone below the very top. So when we talk about reducing health inequalities, what we're talking about is raising and flattening those gradients um, to level up um, the current uh, terminology, to level up healthy life expectancy, to level up life expectancy. And that requires much more action um, towards the bottom end of that graph. So we talk about proportionate action, but we also talk about universal action because everybody is affected by health inequalities to some extent. So we don't want artificial cutoff points where we target action. We want universal action to really raise and flatten those gradients. So we use the um, unattractive phrase of proportionate universalism. Um, and the NHS is actually a very good example of a proportionate and universal uh, service. You're, uh, universally available, um, but action is according to need. It's proportionate to level of need. So this was the graph that actually this is an update. We, we use two sets of figures and the clearer dots on both of the, um, the, the most recent set of data and the smudgier dots are the previous period. But we use this graph all the time. And by the way, we see these relationships in other countries in the world where data is available. And it's not just England, but England does have this very, very clear association and unusually brilliant data. So um, England, we really have been able to do some of the best analysis that we've done, but we do do this work globally. Uh, next slide, please. Um, if you just click through, I think there's six, yes. Bullet points. There we go. Thank you. So this was uh, this was the report. Um, what we also found was that although most people think about healthcare when we talk about health, it's not inequalities in healthcare which are driving these enormous differences in health and in life expectancy. It's the conditions in which we're all living, and the experiences that we have throughout our lives which really produce these health um, inequalities. And the healthcare system. Um, does a great job of treating people, but it's not producing those health inequalities. There are some inequalities which do need to be looked at, and we'll come towards the end of the presentation to considering what the healthcare system can do. But we made six recommendations and we assessed all the evidence showing that health inequalities begin very early in the earliest years of life, and this is also the best time to intervene. I, I, levels of education, training and opportunities for young people have an enormous impact on health and health inequalities throughout life. Quality of work, access to employment and unemployment um, really have a profound effect on health and health inequalities. Um, and in fact, this is where Michael's um, social determinants of health approach really started looking at Whitehall civil servants and finding that gradient that I've just shown you um, for the different grades of the civil service, seeing those health outcomes um, not related to smoking or alcohol, which was what was thought at the time, and conditions at work, but related to their uh, quality of work, the income, uh, where they lived, and the conditions um, that they were living and working in. Number four is a healthy standard of living for all. That's where we talk about income and it's impossible to live healthily, even in England, a uh, rich country, if you don't have a minimum income for healthy living. Um, and we've had various mechanisms for defining what that is, uh, which we argue benefits and minimum wage policies should be set to. And we know there's been enormous increases in in-work poverty and people who are working sometimes two jobs, um, still are unable to uh, live healthily um, and to get out of poverty. Uh, the fifth recommendation around healthy and sustainable places, that's where we think about housing, absolutely critical, uh, quality of housing, ha high streets, um, community functioning, resilience, opportunities for communities to get together, all these things, enormous impacts on health. 
Um, and finally, we came to thinking about public health um, and Ill, Ill health prevention, more traditional public health, smoking, alcohol, obesity, as well as things like vaccinations um, and immunisation, sexual health services and so on. Um, so we had an enormous agenda in the 2010 report. And since then, we've been working to try and embed those recommendations. And clearly, this is an agenda for the whole of government and the whole of society. Um, and one of the things COVID has taught us actually is how the government, all parts of the government, the economy, the Department for Education, um, communities, housing, can come together um, on a specific health agenda um, and have this whole, whole systems approach which is needed for the agenda that we are proposing. Uh, next slide, please. Um, just to say that since the Marmot Review, this was an analysis of health and well-being priorities and the Marmot principles had been, I think this was 20, yeah, 2013, the King's Fund did this analysis, were very well embedded among local authorities and public health. Um, and since then, we've seen enormous interest from local government in Marmot approaches. We've got Marmot cities and Marmot region now, Greater Manchester and others coming along. Um, and again, perhaps a silver lining to the COVID tragedies is that health inequalities have really come to the fore um, and there's a great deal of it certainly we're experiencing an enormous surge of interest in the work that we do around health inequalities including from the private sector uh, voluntary community sector the government um, and a whole range of uh, stakeholders who we haven't had enormous interest from um, I think now taking this agenda very seriously because the pandemic has exposed and amplified um, inequalities. Next slide, please. Um, as Rich mentioned, we did an update um, in March, um, the Marmot Review 10 years on, um, just before the pandemic hit, actually it was published in February. Um, and then of course the pandemic descended upon us. And in that we wanted to do stock take really of what had happened to health inequalities in England since we published the Marmot Review. Um, and we looked at uh, government policies, whether they were supportive or undermining of health inequalities. Um, next slide, please. Um, and what we found actually was very shocking. Um, the, in the regular increases in life expectancy, which we'd seen if we've got graphs taking this way back to 1918, although the data is ropier, um, what we've seen since 2010, and you can see on this graph, is that life expectancies, improvements in life expectancy, have flattened off. Uh, these are average uh, improvements in life expectancy. There's been this big change since 2010 um, that we haven't witnessed before since records began. So something really quite profound um, is happening to drive these worrying trends in life expectancy. Um, next slide, please. Um, we see similar inequalities from the ones which I showed you, which we produced in 2010. Differences um, in life expectancy for men of nine and a half years and for women of approaching eight years between the most deprived and the least deprived deciles of neighbourhoods, of areas. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and in an international context, in comparison with other countries, what we saw in England uh, wasn't necessary, wasn't um, experienced by other countries. And you can see here, we're to only uh, the changes in our life expectancy are lower than every country, all these other rich um, countries, except for Iceland and the USA. Um, and the USA has similarly been having a terrible time um, in their life expectancy declining. Um, the deaths of despair, which you may have he heard of by Case and Deaton, providing some explanations as to what's been happening in the States related to structural poverty, um, drug misuse, alcohol misuse, the deaths of despair um, uh, for many communities in the States. So the UK performing really badly um, uh, between 2011 and 2017. And of course, the pandemic now will have added to this. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in that report, we went over similarly, uh, similar to the areas we covered in the Marmot Review, early years, education, young people, working lives, income and poverty, communities and housing. And in each of these areas, 
we thought about what's been happening, we assessed the data um, and we looked at the policies um, in those areas. Um, and of course, these were the years of austerity. And we, what we found were declines in spending in all these areas, uh, decreases in services, um, undermining of healthy environments, undermining of uh, de significant decreases in education spending, uh, end of short sure start, etc. And we went through all these areas. And if you are interested to look at the report, you will see the kind of chronicle really of uh, impacts that these decreases in spending had. They've been very aggressive, which means that they were harder. There were more, these cuts in finance and resources were more steep in more deprived areas. So more deprived areas where the need was greater um, were hammered hardest by austerity. Next slide, please. Um, so in summary from the 10 years on report, as I said that was published in February, uh, health inequalities have widened and we've seen life expectancy decreasing, decreasing, it's unheard of, for the 10% most deprived women and we think probably decreasing for men, the data is a bit less certain for that. Um, mortality rates have been increasing, especially during middle ages, so it's not older people who are particularly driving these decreases in um, life expectancy. It's mortality rates increasing um, between for people in their 40s to 70. Um, so some really concerning data there. There are big regional differences in life expectancy and health, um, which have increased since 2010. Um, the amount of time in poor health has increased. And as I've mentioned, we related all of this to the policies. Um, well, we related some of this to say all of it is due to austerity is probably overstating, but a large part of this we think is related to what's happened um, as a result of austerity. Um, and in relation to regional differences, the Southeast hasn't experienced the same damaging impacts of austerity and hasn't experienced the same, quite the same uh, damaging impacts to health. Um, next slide, please. And this is just, uh, there's a raft of data in there, and lots of graphs showing similar things. But this I thought was particularly shocking. This is changes, the changes, the decreases in spending, uh, council spending per person um, by level of deprivation. Again, you've got the most deprived areas on the left and the least on the right. And you can see that the uh, local authority spending has decreased decreased the most in more deprived areas. These cuts are aggressive. And we can see this with relation to public services, um, allocations to local governments and other services, you can see over and over again. And of course, the toll is cumulative. It's not just we look in isolation at these slides and at this data, but it's the cumulative impacts to cuts to benefit, to decreases in housing support services, to decreases in environmental services, social care, um, and so on. And it's the cumulative impact of these, which we think is driving these big uh, worrying trends in health inequalities. Next slide, please. So that was the position which we reported on in March. Um, and then of course the pandemic. So in uh, December this year, we uh, did another report, which really builds on the previous two reports, which I've just uh, outlined. Um, called Build Back Fairer. So we looked at what's happened during the pandemic um, and the inequalities um, in mortality um, and infection rates uh, from COVID really mirror the um, social, economic and ethnic inequalities which we've reported on previously. And when the pandemic first hit, uh, Prince Charles was infected, Boris Johnson, etc. And it seemed that it was the wealthier people who'd been traveling and on skiing holidays and so on in February who uh, had the highest rates of infection, but that has very quickly turned to being um, a, inequality, a disease really of inequality um, and mirroring what we would have expected to see with all the other health conditions um, and the evidence that we know about and how they um, drive inequalities in health. Next slide, please. Um, so this is, you have got used to this kind of graph. Now we've got the most deprived on the left and the least deprived areas um, on the right. Um, the dark green bar, the highest level, that's all-cause mortality. Um, 
in 2020. So you can see for all deaths, these inequalities related to level of deprivation, the non-COVID, the pale gray bars, the non-COVID deaths, um, and the COVID deaths. And although it doesn't look quite like this, I think there's some distort visual distortion going on, but the COVID deaths follow exactly the same gradient as the non-COVID deaths. So it's very clear that the most deprived areas have been most affected, poor communities, poor people who can't, um, there's several reasons for this actually, more likely to be in ill health to start with, living in poor, crowded, overcrowded conditions, having to go to work, um, not being able to stay at home and um, working in occupations which involve a lot of contact with the public. Uh, we've done a study of bus drivers for Transport for London, for example, a lot of contact with the public and in close proximity to other workers. So those are the, some of the explanations as to why we're seeing this gradient in COVID deaths. And of course, the ethnicity um, inequalities partly reflect these socioeconomic uh, inequalities and in that you're more likely to find um, black minority ethnic groups um, in occupations such as bus drivers, taxi drivers and so on, which are high risk. Um, but also we're hearing uh, reports of how some uh, BAME communities, workers have been uh, not able to access PPE, have been in the front line, um, unlike their white colleagues. So uh, outcomes of uh, structural racism and discrimination driving some of those ethnic inequalities as well. Next slide, please. That's for women similarly. Next slide, please. Uh, so this changes all the time, of course, and we know that the southeast of London has been particularly badly hit by the third wave. Um, but this was up until uh, early November, you could see the differences in COVID deaths by region. Um, and this is in relation to excess mortality. That's mortality, which is above and beyond what you would expect compared with the average for the previous five years. So this year, there's obviously been a lot of excess mortality driven by COVID and non-COVID, perhaps related to hospital services having to focus on COVID um, and, and so on. But you can see big regional differences there. So these regional inequalities we expect, unfortunately, to increase as well as the socioeconomic increases as a result of COVID. Um, next slide, please. Um, and of course, we know how badly um, England has performed compared with other, even European countries, let alone um, the rest of the world. So here you have, this is um, all cause mortality rates, which obviously includes COVID um, for this year. Um, and you can see uh, England, unfortunately, the highest um, compared to these European countries for both men and women. Uh, obviously, this will change. Uh, this was ONS data, but um, we need to keep updating this, but I don't suppose the position has changed um, through the third wave. Next slide, please. This is making the point which I referred to earlier about overcrowding um, and mortality from COVID. You can see here local authorities by the level of crowding, overcrowded households um, and the association with uh, rates of death from COVID. And you can see a very clear association. Uh, Newham with a large percent of overcrowded households and a high mortality rate. Um, Brent similarly. So it's not a perfect relationship, um, but it's showing a, a close association. Um, next slide, please. Um, and as I mentioned, the inequalities in mortality related to occupation. This is uh, for women, but you can see that professional um, managers and so on have let the black dotted line is the average. This is for women, higher for men. Uh, the average mortality rates from COVID um, and uh, several occupations with much lower rates and then several with much higher rates, caring, leisure and services for women with much higher mortality rates from COVID. Next slide, please. Um, I mentioned as well the um, association between some of the highest risk occupations. 
um, and Black, Asian, minority, ethnic workforce. So having a high percent of the workforce that are uh, BAME is associated with these occupations which are high risk. So taxi drivers, chauffeurs, security guards, um, and you can see some association there, which partly explains the high death rates among, not totally, but partly explains the high death rates among BAME um, communities. Next slide, please. So we, we um, set out the inequalities um, in COVID infection and mortality, but perhaps even more significantly importantly, we began to think about the health impacts of the containment measures. Um, and we will expect ill health to increase, inequalities in ill health to increase as a result of containment measures. So as I mentioned previously, we know that the quality of early years um, and educational attainment, absolutely critical drivers for health and for ill health and inequalities in those drive inequalities in health. Um, so we've all read and heard about the increasing inequalities in education um, and in early years um, that children are um, undergoing and we would expect those to increase inequalities in health. Similarly, the impacts on young people have been absolutely devastating, not just in relation to um, the isolation and the lockdown, which have been terrible as well, but in relation to employment, um, access to services, training, um, and so on. Working lives, the increases in unemployment will lead to, and probably already are leading to worse health. Um, uh, and we expect unemployment to increase uh, substantially, of course, increases in poverty um, and rising wealth and income inequalities. Uh, a lot of people have done quite well, well, not a lot, a small minority of people have done quite well out of the pandemic. Um, and we've seen significant increases in income inequalities. Michael's got a figure, which I can't recall off the top of my head, about the increasing the wealth of the billionaires um, in the US. Um, and it's really quite staggering. Um, so we, we are experiencing increasing wealth and income inequalities. Um, degrade, degradations to places and communities, um, quality of housing, um, we expect all of those to be negatively impacted by containment measures, by um, what's likely to happen to the economy um, and public health. So um, we know Mental health um, has deteriorated through the pandemic and through lockdowns. So we expect, unfortunately, for that to continue increasing even as the lockdowns are lifted. Um, and uh, increasing rates of alcohol misuse, um, smoking is a mixed picture. Um, and um, we're not too sure about drug misuse. There have been reports that it's increased, um, but we'll wait the data for that. Next slide, please. Um, this, is, this is looking at the um, loss of learning. So one of the most immediate impacts, and we know, by the way, that this will translate into health inequalities, as I've said. So the least deprived in the dark green have, all, have suffered um, loss of learning, but um, much less than the more deprived children in the pale green. So you can see a big, bigger proportion of more deprived more deprived than these deprived have lost six months, five months, four months of learning and are really behind half a year, perhaps even more by now, uh, where they should be or where they were expected to be as a result of the, um, of the lockdowns um, and shutdown of schools. And we've got enormous amount of data actually about the impacts on education and a whole range of the impacts of the um, school closures. And we know from other epidemics and pandemics, uh, that girls suffer more than boys, um, that there's uh, significant increases in trauma and abuse of being at home, um, and that's more in more deprived areas. Next slide, please. Uh, this is about food insecurity, and of course, there's been a lot about this, um, but we know uh, there have been significant increases in food insecurity, um, and this just runs up till August, you can see those increases um, and they're particularly steep for uh, larger families with three or more children and two or more children um, and people without children or just one child, the increases haven't been quite as steep, um, still high levels though. 
Next slide, please. Um, so we know this is looking at age groups um, and rates of unhappiness and depression. Um, and you can see increases through the uh, COVID um, months. Um, and you can see that uh, young women and men had the highest increases compared to other uh, age groups. Um, and that's a really concerning um, figure to look at actually, to see these very, very steep increases. And I imagine those have gone up considerably um, through these last few months. Next slide. Actually, it's only a month and a half, but it feels like a lot of months since we've had the, um, this third lockdown. Domestic violence increases. You can see this in the number of calls recorded by the London Metropolitan Police Services. Um, there's been closure of services to support women, um, mainly women, um, in relation to domestic violence um, and increasing need. And um, unfortunately, we expect that goes up till June, expect that to have increased even, even further. Um, data still coming out, um, but really serious issues um, here. Next slide, please. Um, and unemployment again, uh, the increases in unemployment for all age groups, but you can see much higher for the 16 to 24 year olds uh, who are likely to be employed in sectors which are shut down or going to close permanently, hospitality, uh, sport and leisure and so on. Next slide, please. And it's also low income workers who are most likely, who've been most impacted um, by uh, the furloughing and likely unemployment um, you can see here the, the difference between the lowest and the highest income groups in relation to uh, over 30 percent are working in shutdown sectors in the lowest income. Next slide, please. And increases in poverty. So um, the percent paid below the minimum wage um, compar comparisons between 2010 and 2020 uh, for both furloughed and non-furloughed. Um, groups, you can see significant impacts, um, significant increases in every region um, in those 10 years. So paid below the national minimum wage. Um, this is really shocking. I mentioned there's been big increases in work poverty. This partly explains why. I mean, the minimum wage barely keeps you out of poverty, probably doesn't. But to be paid below the minimum wage, 8% um, of workers, good looking 9% in the Northeast, um, really uh, difficult. And this isn't just a result of furlough, it's people who are continuing to work at the place of work. Next slide, please. Um, and again, this north-south divide you can see here. So this is a mm -hmm. analysis from the Joseph Roundtree uh, Foundation looking at where employment recovery from COVID-19 is likely to be hardest. Uh, the darker colours represent the, where it's likely to be hardest. And you can see this southeast faring reasonably well. Some of the coastal areas are less well, the parts of London. But basically, you can see this north-south split in that data. So this is looking forward to, to how we expect to recover from the pandemic. Um, and we're going to be seeing increases in regional inequalities. And as I've said, this will translate into increases in regional health inequalities. Uh, next slide, please. Um, data on alcohol uh, sales. You can see, um, well, you can see, first of all, you can see New Year spike there um, in the data. Um, and then you can see 23rd of March lockdown. You can see the big increases in alcohol sales um, and the different lines refer to different social class groups so alcohol um, sales highest for the c1 um, ab that's the higher social uh, classes um, higher misuse of alcohol or at least higher sales of alcohol um, and lowest in the um, low lower income uh, groups there next slide please by the way, we do know that alcohol harm, although uh, wealthier social class groups always drink more, the harm is felt disproportionately among those in D, C, D, E groups. Um, it's partly the way that alcohol is consumed, you think, um, uh, access to healthcare services and support services, 
um, but harm is, follows the social class gradient and consumption goes the other way. So um, very quick run through of the work that we did in relation uh, to the pandemic. And there's an awful lot more in the report, of course. So why has all this happened? Why has England been hit so hard um, by the pandemic, uh, both in health terms and economic terms? So we talk about governance and political cultures. Um, it's a, it's the, the way that basically we're referring here to the way that the management of the pandemic has gone to the lack of preparedness in advance, to trust in the messages from politicians um, and for those from those in um, positions of power and influence. Um, so we really setting out our story here that the, the governance makes an enormous difference to how the pandemic has been and the economy has been handled. Um, we knew because we'd reported on it and other people had reported on it that social and economic inequalities were increasing. Hardly surprising that the pandemic has seen these really um, unequal um, impacts in terms of infection and mortality and in terms of the impacts of containment measures, which I've just very briefly overviewed. Um, austerity, so we had seen these enormous reductions in spending on public services and local authorities. Um, uh, benefits, social protection mechanisms, or support services that people need. We were ill prepared for the pandemic. Um, and then those kind of impacts which I talked about and we reported on in 10 years on really made a difference to how well areas are able to cope, how well communities are able to cope with the impacts of containment, with the impacts of the pandemic. And of course the health. Uh, we were unhealthy coming into the pandemic and I mentioned this earlier. Uh, we'd seen rising inequalities in health, we'd seen increases in ill health, um, and we'd seen that our life expectancy was plateauing. So there was a lot of ill health in this country and unequally um, distributed ill health. So given that poor health is a big risk factor for um, COVID-19, it's really hardly surprising that we've seen these, these very clear inequalities in mortality and infection. We've um, We've made a lot of recommendations in the report, which I won't go over here, but we make them in relation to what to do next, to build back fairer, to improve um, and make more equal the early years, education, working lives, all those areas which I, I covered as driving um, ill health and health. Um, we've made recommendations for the short, medium and long term, um, mainly to the government, but also to local authorities, um, and to the healthcare system as well. Um, it's less obvious. We spend a lot of time saying, what can the healthcare, this health is not just the responsibility of the healthcare sector, it's the responsibility of all of us um, and all those different sectors which I've outlined. But of course, the healthcare system has rightly been asking us for quite a while, what can we do about this? We're the ones best placed, we're trusted in this. And I'll just come on to a few of the, the areas that we touch on um, in relation to this. So next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Uh, we know there's inequalities in access and outcomes within the NHS, but they're quite small, really. And as I said, they're certainly not responsible for um, the, the wide scale inequalities that we've seen. This is just um, evidence of some of the inequalities. So this is uh, levels of preventable hospitalisation by area deprivation. And you can see this gradient, the most deprived have higher rates of preventable hospitalization than the least deprived. So there's a job to do here in reducing these inequalities. Next slide. Um, we've also, this was a report we did with the British Medical Association. We've also done one for a global report looking at the role of health professionals in tackling the social determinants of health. Um, and of course, health professionals are busy uh, treating people, of course, diagnosing and treating people. Um, and there's a limited expectation that they can suddenly devote time to improving the conditions in what people, uh, in which people live. But there are some very clear ways that this can be achieved. Next slide, please. Um, we talk about education and training, which is minimal on health inequalities and social determinants of health. We teach one course at UC. L are for, for undergraduates in medical training. 
um, and it's really the first and only time they come across social determinants of health um, and that's mirrored in medical uh, colleges all over England. Uh, what can they do with their patients, with individuals and within communities? Then there's the health sector as employers, how to improve the health of their own employees, uh, absolutely critical. The NHS employs over a million people, I forget the exact figure, but biggest workforce in the world, um, I think. Uh, what can be done to improve the health of employees? We see these gradients um, within the NHS workforce as well. Working in partnership with other sectors, with housing, with um, schools locally in places, um, improving the quality of building high streets and so on, doctors and nurses and the whole healthcare workforce has an enormous role really as advocates within their local communities, standing up for healthy environments, um, for healthy work practices, working with employees. So there's a whole raft of um, suggestions we make as to how to improve the conditions in which people are living and working and how the um, healthcare workforce can support that agenda. Um, and as national advocates, and we all, I think, uh, know how the, the data which shows that politicians are the least trusted um, by the general public. Well, I think the healthcare workforce is the most trusted, very powerful advocates at national, international and local level. So there's an important role there as well. Next slide, please. Um, healthcare systems and organisations such as the trust, um, uh, what can be done there in relation to uh, their own organisational systems. And we had a discussion um, about this the other day, looking at uh, the way that money is spent, where is it spent, who's benefiting from the contracts uh, that the healthcare system has in place. And uh, obviously there's an enormous budget for the NHS as a whole. How is that spent? What is its role in alleviating poverty and improving health um, in terms of the money that's circulating through the economy? Um, workforce practice, we've just uh, very briefly overviewed, but that's critical and we're thinking all the time about, and my, we're in contact with um, a range of uh, workforce organisations, rural colleges, uh, medical practitioners, um, to think about what can be done day to day to really embed social determinants of approaches to improving health um, in day to day work. Public health. Uh, so. This trust has a very strong public health um, function and team, but it's not typical. Most trusts don't have public health embedded within the trust to really work out how not just to treat people effectively, but how to prevent ill health um, before they come through the doors um, to reduce demand on the services and to improve the health of the local population. And that relates to the fourth point, area-based activities. What, a, what can organisations and trusts do in their local places to improve the conditions there? Um, and there's been quite a strong growing recognition of um, the role of what large employers um, with big budgets within their local places, the anchor um, organisation approach. So thinking of uh, hospitals as anchor organisations in local communities, um, which really can affect their, the health of their local area through employment, through contracts, um, and through the work that they do um, in improving health locally. Uh, next slide. I'm going to skip through these actually because they just provide a bit more detail. You can um, request these slides if you're interested. So if we just go through the these next few, but it's really trying to put a bit more flesh on some of the uh, things I've just been talking about uh, in relation to those four areas. So, sorry, we just skip through down the next one, down the next one, down the next one. So, um, sorry, it's been a very um, brief, long, but brief overview of a lot of work that we've done over 10 years. Um, and really, I do think that this, there is now an opportunity um, for us all to focus much more on health inequalities. As I've said, the pandemic has exposed these inequalities. I think there's been a great recognition that much more needs to be done to reduce health inequalities. And certainly, as I've said, there's a huge uh, upswell of interest in these issues. And I think if we all put our heads together, uh, we can make some real impact on the lives and health of those people whose health is damaged um, by the conditions in which they're living and working.
Thank you very much. Um, Jess, yeah, th thank you. Wow, thank you. I mean, that was a complete tour de force. And actually, I, you know, um, just uh, heart stoppingly bleak um, to hear just the accumulation of things which are impacting on the, the people that we as a trust support um, 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 in, 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 in some of our more deprived communities in particular in London and Luton and Bedford and just, um, I don't know how other people feel, but incredibly anger inducing um, hearing just the accumulation of those things. And I guess that um, thankfully kind of finished on some points uh, to look to the future, which kind of hopefully have some hope around them, around the sort of practical things that we can do, because it feels as if, if many of the sort of things that need to be done are in the realm of politics but that also there are things that we as a big organization uh, can do practically um, uh, and in particular in working with um, with our partners I mean I was particularly struck by the slide about um, uh, the local authority spending um, 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 implications and how their savings programs have impacted particularly on the more deprived communities, because if the local authorities can't get that right, um, then, you know, and I'm particularly thinking, you know, Luton, for example, Luton Council, have got a deficit of 57 million pounds. Um, so how's that going to be delivered in the most, um, in, in a way that impacts on the most deprived communities the least? We're seeing local authorities coming forward with savings programmes which impacting on our cam services at the moment it's a very live issue for us you know and we're seeing this surge in our cams in referrals and our cams uh, to our cams teams at the moment so so I feel it all feels really urgent um and 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 in particular um the kind of the aim that we've set through our inequalities work stream is to do our bit um to make our corner of the world as a fairer place to live and work and and it feels as if there are, we're already doing the things that we think we can do, but it feels as if, in your conclusions, there are there are other things that we can think about um, in order to take forward to deliver on that um, commitment. Um, we we are um, we, we don't have, we only got one minute left, so I just want to check whether anybody's got any really burning um, questions um, or or comments. Um, uh, if you do, please speak up. I'm. I'm if not, I'm going to just invite Angela to say a, f a few words too. I can't see anybody. Angela, do you want to come in? No, just to say thanks, Jess. And, and I've seen some of those graphs before and they're just still shocking. And I think it's a constant reminder. And in particular, the life expectancy difference for women in the most deprived areas reducing. It's just such a call for action and the gap in learning as well from COVID. And also I think that sort of system level, what are we doing is what we can do in ELFT, you know, with our staff and with our outsourced staff, et cetera, but also just in terms of the system partnership. So um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a timely reminder that we really need to kind of start taking some quite drastic and radical action, I think. Um, well, thank you very much. I'm sorry I took up all the time. Uh, I didn't mean to, but um, I, there's a lot to cover. And as you all both said, these are critical issues. I think we know we know enough now to know what's gone wrong, and therefore we also know how to put it right. So, and without feeling too pessimistic because it's going in the wrong direction, I think there are big opportunities at the moment. I mean, I'm quite encouraged. I may, it may not come across from the presentation and data. But uh, optimistically, there's, there's an awful lot of interest in this now. And I think, you know, the government itself has committed to a levelling up agenda. We can hold them to account um, and we know what's gone wrong and we know how to put it right. So this is a good place in a way to, to, to start from really pushing now um, on this. And as you said, this is absolutely central to the work of the trust to a whole range of stakeholders. So I'm delighted that you're interested um, and we can collaborate together to really drive this forward. Thank you so much, Jess, um, for spending this hour with us. Um, Norbert, um, I get where you're coming from with your comment, but, but
but don't be disheartened because we as an organization are really committed to doing our bit on this agenda. Um, we have through the pandemic and prior to the pand pandemic, so many members of our staff who are properly fired up and wanting to do their bit to tackle inequalities. Um, and, and as an organization, we will continue to support the organization and staff and our teams um, to, to, to do so. I think um, we can recirculate uh, building back fair around the um, around the inequalities uh, work stream, and also um, I think the um, working for health equity paper will be really helpful and, and interesting to recirculate too. And as Shay says, we can all vote. Okay, <laughs> thanks very much indeed, everybody. And thanks in particular to Jess. That's been a really fantastic, um, uh, fantastic session. Thank you. Thank you.